Hello again. Welcome to another episode of Gong Ho. It's March 11, 2024. I'm here with my very good friend Jeff Sussman, a publicist and author, and uh, always good to be with. What I want you to do is just give us a list of the boxing books and the mob books that you've published. Okay, it started with a book called uh, Max Baer and Barney Ross, Jewish Heroes of Boxing. And then I did uh, Rocky Graziano, uh, Fame, Fists, and Fortune. And after that, I did one called uh, Boxing in the Mob. After that, I did one called uh, Big Apple Gangsters, The Rise and Decline of the Mob in New York. And followed that with a book called Holocaust Fighters, Boxers, Resisters, and Avengers. And that was followed by Sin City Gangsters, The Rise and Decline of the Mob in Las Vegas. And my newest book, which just came out last week, is Tinseltown Gangsters, The Rise and Decline of the Mob in, in Hollywood. Yes. All right. I, I read almost all of it. I don't know how we're going to cover that book in one show. I don't think it's possible. So we'll do two shows. Do two shows. Right. Uh, it's... I mean, to open the book up and realize the first gangster was Joseph Kennedy. I know. <laughs> I, I want to spend some time with that. I mean, he was an incredible... Start with him. I mean, well, he was a, a shark. Going, he, he really was a shark. He was like a, a great white. A great white shark who would eat anything in its path. Um, he, he started out uh, as a sales representative for a, a movie company called FOB. They wanted him to find a buyer for the company, and his attitude was, heck, why should I find a buyer? I'll buy the company, and I'll, and I'll run it. And he borrowed some money from his father-in-law and, and, and some money from the president of Filene Department Store in Boston. But he, the bulk of the money he borrowed from Al, Al Capone's mob in, in, in Chicago. And he was turning out a movie a week uh, at thirty thousand dollars a movie, but the reason he can go to the mob is because they knew him already. They knew him already because he had also partnered with uh, Frank Costello in the bootlegging business, and, and he had done all kinds of uh, uh, deals with the New York mob and 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 with the um, with, with 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 the outfit. And it, it it was funny regarding Frank Costello. Frank Costello's original name was Francisco Castiglia. But because he was dealing so much with Irish gangsters, he changed his name to Frank Costello so he would fit in with them. But, but um, after Joseph Kennedy uh, bought FOB, he began to become uh, n known for his uh, capacity to manage money. And he started having an affair with Gloria Swanson, who was the biggest movie star of the day. And he showered her with all kinds of gifts, fur coats, diamond necklaces, even bought her, a, I think it was a Rolls Royce. And three years later, her accountant, who was doing her books, discovered that all of these wonderful gifts that Joe Kennedy had given her, she had paid for out of her own account. He was such a cheapskate, he wouldn't part with a nickel to give her, but he pretended all along that he was giving her these lavish gifts, and they all, came, all the money for it, it, it came out of her bank account. Did he take any money besides for the gifts? He may have. Uh, well, yeah, he, he, he took a management fee for, for managing her finances. And uh, was that the demise of his career in Hollywood? No. After that, uh, he wanted to buy a chain of movie theaters called uh, the Pantages Movie Theaters, which was started by a Greek immigrant named Alexander Pantages. And Pantages owned, I think it was 72 movie theaters throughout the Southwest. And Kennedy made a couple of offers to buy these, and each offer was rejected. So Kennedy, he had been pursued by a man who was an aspiring screenwriter and a pimp, whose girlfriend was an aspiring actress and a prostitute. And he, they couldn't get anywhere with, with uh, Kennedy, but when Kennedy decided he could use them to help him get Pantages theaters, he contacted them, and he, he said to the 
the woman who was the aspiring actress and prostitute, whose name was Eunice Pringle, I'll give you a part in my next movie, but you have to do a favor for me. And she agreed to do it. And the boyfriend, the aspiring screenwriter, went along with this. So what she did is she hid in a closet off of... Wait a minute. She back up. She contacted... What's his name again? The owner of the theaters. A Alexander Pantages. And she said she wanted to show him a screenplay. Right. I, right. A a yeah, that, that her boyfriend had written. And he took one look at it and he said, this is terrible. This is written by an amateur. He doesn't have any talent whatsoever. So she was kind of pissed at this uh, uh, reaction. So she had a reason for disliking this guy. But she also, he knew her now and she could gain access to his office. So after Kennedy made a deal with her, she hid in Pantages's closet in, off of his office. And when Pantages came, she opened the door and uh, threw herself out, t tore the top of her gown and started yelling rape. And Pantages was arrested and at trial, he was convicted and he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Uh, uh, for rape, which was, I mean, murderers were getting less time uh, th than that. Then Kennedy was behind this. And Kennedy was behind the whole thing. So then what happened, uh, Pantages hired a criminal defense attorney named Jerry Geisler, who represented the mob in Los Angeles, uh, and in particular, uh, Bugsy Siegel. And he was able to prove that there was a conspiracy. And he presented this evidence to the uh, Court of Appeals in uh, California, and, and uh, Pantages was released from prison after three years. But they also wanted a deposition from Pringle stating that oh, she had don't participated. Know she, gets murdered. she was poisoned the day before she was to give the deposition and, and died from the poisoning, and no one was ever convicted or, or, or tried for poisoning. You know, I never heard this before about Joseph Kennedy. Uh, can you go on a little bit more about him? Well, well he, he, he was a real SOB. I mean, and he didn't want to stay in Hollywood because he was also a terrible snob. And all the original movie studios were started by immigrant Jews from Russia and Eastern Europe. And he didn't want to associate with these people. He wanted to associate with the WASP establishment. And he re would refer to these other movie producers as, as uh, kikes and as sheenies and as pants pressers. And so eventually he sold um, his interest in the, in the movie business and he moved to Florida for a while. And in, in Florida, in, um, in um, what is that section of Par uh, Florida with? West Palm Beach. Yeah, P Palm Beach. Um, he tried to join a, uh, a WASP uh, country club and golf club and they wouldn't take him because he was Catholic. But there was a Jewish club there also. And they said, we'll take you. We take anybody. <laughs> you know, we have no prejudice against anyone. But Kennedy refused to join them because he didn't want to associate anymore with Jews. And he would, So in addition to being a crook, he was also a terrible anti-Semite. And, um, you know, eventually uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, hired him to be the, uh, to head the Securities and Exchange Commission. And when he was, uh, when Roosevelt was asked why he hired Kennedy, he said, it takes a thief to catch a thief. And that's oh, why I hired him. And then he went on to become the ambassador to Britain. Right. And, and he was very uh, supporting the Germans, the Nazis. Right. He, he, he fell in with a group of um, the uh, British lords and ladies known as the Cliventon Group. And they, they were in favor of appeasing and, and making a, a treaty with Hitler and, and, and having a union between Nazi Germany and England. And Roosevelt, uh, I mean, uh, Kennedy was promoting this and it eventually it became a terrible embarrassment. He was to, trying to, to, he was trying to um, do our foreign policy. You can't do that. That's right. He's not only trying to do a foreign policy, he wanted a treaty between the United States and Nazi Germany. Did he, did he get fired? Yes, Roosevelt finally fired him. But he, he still had a lot of clout. He had a lot of clout. And, and he, you know, he at one point wanted to be become president after Roosevelt. And his attitude was, well, you know, you've ruined my chances for becoming president, but I'm going to make sure now that one of my sons becomes president. And he did. And he did. <clears throat> wow. All right. <clears throat> okay. So he paved the way. <laughs> he was like, 
and and everybody, the mobsters, the gangsters, realized, let's go out there and do something. So what happened after Kennedy left? Well, well the outfit in Chicago and the New York mobsters decided that uh, they didn't realize this initially that Hollywood was really ripe uh, for, for, for takeover, and they agreed that uh, Bugsy Siegel uh, uh, should go out there. Initially, he went out there to run a racing wire that bookies had to uh, subscribe to. But as he became more and more involved, he also took over the union for the extras and began to extort the movie studios, saying, if you didn't want a strike of extras, which you need for all your movies, you, you have to pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and, and they did. And because he was sort of a, a classy gangster, you know, he was always very, very well dressed. He was well spoken. He socialized with an A-list of, of Hollywood movie stars and producers and directors. They were also terrified of him because they knew he of his reputation as a gangster. He had a nickname. Uh, B Bugsy. And why was that? Because he was as crazy as a bed bug. <laughs> and uh, they, um, he used to borrow money from them. And, and they were always frightened of asking him to pay back the money because they thought if they asked him, they might get killed. So he, he, in a conversation with Meyer Lansky, he said, you know, I've, I've borrowed almost a half a million dollars from these people and I've never paid it back and I have no intention of paying it back. That's, that's what happens when you, have to, <laughs> you give money to a mobster. But um, he is also, did he have the idea to build the flamingo in? No, no. It, it, that was really a misconception that a lot of people believe. The flamingo was started by a man named Billy Wilkerson who owned a newspaper called The Hollywood Reporter and some restaurants in, in Beverly Hills. And he went out to Hollywood, uh, I, I'm sorry, to Las Vegas to build a flamingo and he ran out of money. And at that time, banks wouldn't lend money for casinos. They thought it wasn't a good risk. So he, he had to borrow money and he borrowed it from the New York mob. And after a few months, uh, Bugsy Siegel said to him, we're, we're taking over and, 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 and you're out. And, and Wilkerson didn't want to get out. So, so Bugsy said to him, you either sell me your shares or I'm going to kill you. And so he sold the shares, but he was also frightened of being killed. And he went and lived in France for a year j just to be on the safe side. And then Bugsy took over the building of, of, of the Flamingo. But that, that resulted in him being murdered. Right, because he, he was skimming money from, from, his, from his own mob. With his girlfriend. His, he and his girlfriend, Virginia Hill, were, were, were skimming money. And his best friend, uh, or one of his good friends, was Joe Draft. Which is, uh, I mean, they really were good friends. Very, very good friends. Uh, uh, George Raft had started out as a protege of a New York gangster named Oni Madden, who was the biggest bootlegger in New York. And Raft was, you know, like a kid who followed him around. And through Oni Madden, he met a, a Bugsy Siegel. And even though they were very close in age, he looked up to, to Bugsy as if he were an older brother, and, and he did whatever he could uh, for, for Bugsy. He would lend him money knowing that he would never get the money back, and on the opening of the Flamingo, he even bet $65,000, which he lost because he knew that that money would, would help uh, uh, the Flamingo. He was a very, very loyal friend. But George uh, Ramps was uh, really big time, right? He, he, he was one of the biggest movie stars of, of the 1930s and 1940s. And he unfortunately turned down some very good roles that were offered to him. He, he made very bad decisions. So for instance, uh, the role that Humphrey Bogart played in the Maltese Falcon, that was offered to George Raft and he turned it down. And he turned down other big roles like that. And, and as a result of that, his career started tapering hum off. Humphrey Bogart actually sort of superseded him, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, all right. so. Bugsy gets killed, and did he have a protege coming up? Yeah, a man named Mickey Cohn. How did that come about? <laughs> it sounds like a Jewish name. He was Jewish. He, he, was, Jewish. he, he, he was a Jewish gangster. You, you, you know, a lot of people don't realize it, that probably up until the 1970s, half of organized crime in America was either Jewish or Italian. Well, you told me, you. I mean, I learned from you that basically the beginning of the mom Basically, some Jews got together and educated some Italians. And <laughs> well, well, what it was, it was, it was a man named Arnold Rothstein, who, who was a br brilliant about organizing criminals. And he had four protégés 
two Jews and two Italians, yeah. Bugsy Siegel, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, and um, who's the other one? Oh, and, and Lucky Luciano. A and, and, and Luciano and Lansky had been friends since they were about 13 or 14 years old. They met on the Lower East Side. So this guy, uh, Mickey Cohen, he's from the Chicago mob? Yes. Well, what was interesting, he started out in Brooklyn as a kid. His father died. His mother was very poor and she couldn't make a living. So she was told that she could do better if she moved to California. So they moved to an area in Los Angeles called Boyle's Heights, which was a Jewish neighborhood. And uh, right away, uh, Mickey Cohn, who was about nine years old at the time, started being a, a little gangster. He formed a little gang, uh, you know, of kids nine and ten years old. And he went with a baseball bat and held up the biggest movie theater in Los Angeles, threatening to beat the, uh, the woman in the box office unless she turned over all the receipts for the day. And she was terrified of this little kid with the bat. Did so he she... get caught? No, he didn't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, so, so then, uh, as he got, he was not a big guy. He, he was only, when he was fully grown, he was only five foot five. But he was a very tough guy. And he also started out as a, as a boxer. And, and he had nine or ten professional fights. He lost half of them. He won half of them. And he, he moved to Chicago. And he um, uh, w was holding up stores and, and, and committing a lot of crimes there. And the, the, the outfit was getting upset because he was bringing a lot of heat on them. And uh, a gangster named, um, Jewish gangster, I, I can't think of his name offhand, advised him to go to Los Angeles. And the outfit thought that would be good for him also because he could then help out uh, Bugsy Siegel. He could become a bad man for Bugsy Siegel because Bugsy didn't want to directly extort the movie studios. He'd have uh, he'd do Mickey bad, Cohn. He'd do the bad deeds. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so Mickey Cohn did that for him. And, and he, he loved Bugsy Siegel. When he first met him, he thought Bugsy was a very kind of a feet guy because he was always sitting under a sun lamp at the YMCA and, and he was exercising all the time. And he was trying to look like a movie star rather than a gangster. And that didn't sit well with Mickey Cohn. But, but finally, um, you know, he, he realized that Mick, uh, Bugsy's power and so forth. And uh, when, when, after Bugsy uh, was killed, Mick, Mickey Cohn took over his operations and uh, continued e e extorting uh, the movie studios with the uh, extras union. But then he also started a, a scandal sheet called uh, Hollywood Nightlight, Nightlife. And his partner in that was a man named Hank Santacola, who was uh, Frank Sinatra's manager. And they, they would go to f famous movie stars who were adulterous or they were gay or something, and they would threaten to blackmail them in, in, in this uh, scandal sheet unless they took out a full page ad and, 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 and paid a lot of money. Uh, to extortion. That. Extortion, yeah. A and so they extorted Robert Mitchum, they extorted Joan Crawford uh, because they knew that she had, before she became a movie star, she had appeared in a couple of porno movies. And they even extorted Frank Sinatra, even though Frank Sinatra's manager was the co-publisher. <laughs> because he was having an affair with, with Ava Gardner <laughs> while married to his first wife. Right. So, so um, uh, and, and w when uh, 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 Mickey Cohn also had a, um, a protege, a, a guy named uh, Johnny Stampinato, who, who was like a professional gigolo. He, he, he was very handsome and debonair looking. And uh, you know, he, he always had the shirts open down to, to, to his sternum with a lot of gold chains. And he was having an affair with uh, Lana Turner. A, 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 and uh, he had affairs with a lot of other uh, women as well. And, and, oh, at, at, at one point, um, uh, Johnny Stampinato was having an affair with Ava Gardner. And oh, my God. And, and, and Frank Sinatra was very upset about this. So he went to Mickey Cohn and asked him if he could talk to Johnny Stampinato because he didn't want Stampinato to be having an affair with the woman he loved. And Mickey Cohn said, I'll speak to him and take care of it, and he did. But then he let it be known amongst all the gangsters that Frank Sinatra was frightened of confronting uh, Johnny Stampinato on his own. And, and this reduced... Uh, 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 Sinatra's reputation with, well, with, with not, local mobsters. He was not part of it. He was not in the family. No, he wasn't. 
and, and, but he was always trying to be a tough guy and pretend he was yeah, a tough guy. And, and, he, and he wasn't a tough guy. You know, he would start fights with people, but then he had these tough guy managers who would come in and finish the fight for him. Yeah, that's not a way to do business. No. It's <laughs> not good. So, so anyway, uh, uh, Lana Turner uh, uh, killed uh, uh, Johnny Stompanato. She stabbed him uh, several times while he was sleeping. But to save her career, oh, she hired the same lawyer that got, that helped the guy that Kennedy uh, set up for prison, uh, uh, Jerry Geisler, who was supposedly a terrific criminal defense attorney. And he convinced uh, Lana Turner's daughter to, to take the rap for, for uh, stabbing Johnny Stampinato. Was there a trial or just? Yeah, there, there was a trial wow. and, and, and she was acquitted. The daughter, Cheryl Crane, was acquitted for self-defense. Because she said she heard her mother screaming and she went into the bedroom. She had a knife in her hand and Johnny Stompanato ran at her and ran right into the knife and stabbed her. I heard himself. that before somewhere. <laughs> so, however, you know, he died on the floor, supposedly, after she stabbed him. There was no blood on the floor. However, the, the sheets uh, on Lana Turner's bed where he had been stabbed was covered in blood. Um, but Mickey Cohen got mad about that, right? He, he was furious. He, he knew that Lana Turner had stabbed, and, and he had all the love letters that, that um, he, he, he broke into Johnny Stompanato's house and stole the love letters. From between, Lana Turner? From to, Lana Turner and, and to Johnny Stompanato. And he published them? He, he threatened to publish them, and but he did a lot of uh, press conferences and, 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 and news stories uh, 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 about these, but it, it really had no effect uh, on, on her career because the publicity machinery at the movie studio where she worked was so powerful that they kept putting out stories. This is all happening, what, during the 40s? Uh, no, that, that happened in the uh, 50s. 50s. Yeah. Um, and, and Mickey Cohen became a celebrity. He did, he, did, he did a lot of talk shows. He, he always had a girlfriend who was either a stripper or a porno actress who was about a foot taller than he was, uh, you know, with the big blonde hair and the plunging necklines on a gown. And together they would do uh, a lot of uh, talk shows in, in California. And there was even, there was a talk show on, syndicated around the country in the 1950s, run by a guy named Alexander King, who, who was sort of a character. And he always had Mickey Cohn on as a guest. And, and, and Mickey Cohn was even on a, uh, an interview show with Mike Wallace. And, and, and Mike Wallace said to him, is it true that you've killed a lot of people? And Mickey Cohn said, I only killed people who deserved killing. I never killed anyone who didn't deserve to be killed. <laughs> oh my God. I had a client say to me one time, I said, did you do it? He said, yeah, he deserved to be killed. <laughs> <laughs> and that justified it, right? <laughs> that's it. All right, same thing. All right, so well, Mickey was a really tough guy. So how did he deal with, you know, these people, you know, Wealthy people, powerful people in Hollywood. He, he, he intimidated them. And, and, and he would, uh, you know, threaten to, to, to kill their representatives. And, and uh, you know, there was another mafia family in uh, Los Angeles, the Dragna Mafia family, run by a guy named Jack Dragna. And he, he was ruled by um, Bugsy Siegel. He, he hated Bugsy Siegel, but Bugsy Siegel ruled him. And he knew that if he went against Bugsy Siegel, that uh, Lansky and Luciano would kill him. But after Bugsy Siegel was killed, Dragnet said, I don't have to do this anymore. And he uh, went against uh, Mickey Cohen. And, and there were 10 or 11 times he tried to kill Mickey Cohen and, and, and never succeeded. One time he planted a bomb under the uh, bedroom of M Mickey Cohen's home. And Mickey Cohen and his wife used to sleep in separate bedrooms. But that night he was sleeping with his wife in her bedroom and the bomb went off and blew up half the house. What happened to this guy? Jack Dragner? He eventually got, uh, he got jailed for something stupid. I mean, I forgot exactly what it was. I think it was having sex with an underage girl or something like that. I mean... Did, did he get framed? Some... No, he, he, he wasn't framed. He, he was just an idiot, basically. They called his, his mafia family was so inept that the police referred to it as the Mickey Mouse Mafia. They, they could never do anything right. And then um, his nephew, uh, another dragon, I forgot his first name, became a co-boss of that family with a guy named Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano. 
Um, and years later, Fradiano uh, went into the witness protection program and wrote a couple of books about the mob. One of them became a, a big bestseller called The Last Mafioso. Um, and and he, he, Fradiano was an interesting man all by himself. Uh, eventually, the, the, uh, the Chicago outfit where uh, Fradiano was associated with, they demoted him from being a, a co-boss down to being a soldier. We have a minute left. I just want to ask you one question before we go off. What about the police doing all this time? They were totally corrupt. Totally. Uh, yeah, and and it, it was interesting because uh, they, they were bugging. Uh, the, the police were bugging Mickey Cohn and, and a prostitute. Uh, and, and, and they heard on, on the bug that, that a police sergeant was being paid off by the prostitution uh, and, and they were providing prostitution services as part of the payoff to the whole police department, basically, in Los Angeles. So this resulted in the sergeant uh, being uh, kicked out of the police department, as well as the chief of police being kicked out of it. And, and, and Mickey was thrilled about this because they had been extorting him, and now they were out of the picture, and he was free to do whatever he wanted. All right, we have just a few seconds. Um, we could come back or we can keep going. It's up to you. It's fine. We can keep going. All right. We're done.